Welcome back to Science Periodically, everyone. Today's quick break from home isolation involves a favorite here at the School of Science, Dr. Jeffrey Watt. Dr. Watt is a math professor as well as the department chair of math and an all-around wonderful individual. Before we do dive into the interview, though, let me introduce myself and flip through a few news pieces for you guys. So for those of you that are new here, my name is Dustin Ryder, and I'm a forensic science and biology student here at IUPUI. I'm originally from South Bend, Indiana, so if you're familiar with the Notre Dame area, that's where I'm from. Every week I dress as a famous scientist, and if you can guess who I am, your name will be entered for a chance to win some cool science gear. Last week I was dressed as Isaac Newton, the famous physicist and mathematician who developed the principles of modern physics, including the laws of motion, and is credited as one of the greatest minds of the 17th century scientific revolution. Everyone who sent in their guests has been added to a random name generator that I have, so we can choose that winner. And the winner is Dama Amro. I'm gonna apologize if, I, apologize if I said your name incorrectly, but congratulations. We will reach out to you shortly so you can pick which prize you would like. And then this week's prize for which scientist am I is pretty much all about you. We wanna give you the opportunity to choose from our science prizes should you find yourself next week's winner. The prizes include a science beanie, socks, pins, water bottles, shirts, books, bobbleheads, and even a card holder for your phone. Make sure you guys listen for this week's hint at the end of the show so you can submit your guests to science at iupui.edu. Now let's talk about the news. Our first piece is all about the murder hornets. Everyone is probably wondering uh, what happened to them. They were a really big rage not too long ago. Now I'm no Coyote Peterson, but I can tell you that this invasive species of hornets are no joke, especially their painful stings. It seems these Asian giant hornets aren't as much of a threat as we originally thought, unless you're a honeybee, of course. These hornets have been known to wipe out entire bee colonies in 90 minutes by decapitating the bees and feasting on the larvae. Most reports on this wasp were centered in Washington state with entomologists agreeing that it is very unlikely that these hornets will appear in Indiana anytime soon, so that's a plus. But they are working on controlling them due to their threat to the native honeybee population. I also did just watch a TikTok the other day where a girl had captured one of those hornets, and I'm, I think I'm pretty good with just sticking to my job as an interviewer, honestly. And then here at IUPUI, we have some exciting news for the School of Science and Computer Science. IUPUI is launching a new research institute that will take an integrative approach to developing cutting edge artificial intelligence technologies, bringing the government and industry players together with university researchers. For those of you that might not be familiar with what AI is, this is a branch of computer science that works to develop the intelligence of the machines to kind of think and work like humans do. We're surrounded by it daily, whether it be Siri, Google, or even Alexa and even your online ads on your social media account. So Dr. Xiaofen Fang of Computer Science will serve as the director of the Institute for In Integrative Artificial Intelligence, which is launching this month. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure you guys keep an eye out for that. And then not too, oop, one more too many, hold on. <laughs> Here we go. Not too far from IUPUI's, the Humane Society of Indianapolis where we find our next piece of news and really heartwarming one at that. The Indy Humane Foster Program has found a surge in families uh, participating in fostering. So with the pandemic causing social distancing, people have kind of found companionship in these animals. And over 425 animals have actually found foster homes through Indy Humane alone. Though their adoption numbers are kind of down from this time last year, they do expect an increase once in-person visits become an option once more. And I also want to give a big thank you to anybody that is fostering animals. You guys are awesome. And then the new section wouldn't be complete without letting you guys know about virtual opportunities. First up, we have mini lessons and songwriting tips from the Grammy Museum. If you're interested in learning DJing in five minutes, uh, this is definitely the virtual mini lesson of your dreams. <laughs> if that doesn't really spark your interest and travel is kind of more up your alley, then you guys can take a moment to explore Alaska. Fairbanks has a 360 degree video where you get to experience the midnight, sign, midnight sun, northern lights, and some of their popular attractions. 
You can even experience the thrill of dog mushing, which means you guys know what I'll be doing once this episode is over. Now, if you'd rather learn a little bit more about your new home, IUPUI, then I have just a thing for you. Admissions has a 360 degree campus visit where you can explore the campus from the comfort of your home. This is a great opportunity for those of you that haven't really had the chance to take a full campus tour or just really wanna take another look around. So from an AI institute to dog mushing, that brings, us a that brings a close to today's news section here on Science Periodically. I am excited to introduce this week's guest, Dr. Jeffrey Watt, the department chair here at IUPUI. Some of you may have him in the fall if you're signed up for Math 165, which is Calculus 1. And Jeff has a really interesting personal journey beginning his college career as a geology major before discovering his passion for math as well as storied experiences here at IUPUI. So while some of you may not be math majors, I can definitely guarantee this episode is going to be well worth your time. So Jeff, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Thank you, uh, first of all, for having me on your show. Uh, this sounds so exciting. Uh, your personality keeps changing on me here, so I, I can't guess who you are yet, but this week. So um, uh, to answer your question, um, which was what again? Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Oh, kind of, okay. So as you uh, as already started the introduction uh, for me about uh, being department chair, uh, my area is actually mathematics education. And uh, before that, it was heavy into applied mathematics, starting with a geology degree, geophysics, fluid dynamics. Um, and then it wasn't until I finished my doctorate that I thought I'd emphasize on specifically um, math education because I knew I was going to take a job here at IUPUI. And 35, 40 years ago, when I started here, uh, this was very much a commuter campus with less than 10,000 students at IUPUI. Oof, times have definitely changed. <laughs> yeah, so for some of your uh, um, recruits for next year, uh, they're coming here next year, you probably have heard your grandparents say, uh, oh yeah, IUPUI, that uh, community college attached to a medical school. Well, now we have in 35 years gone from less than 10,000 students to over 30,000 students. So the campus has tripled in, in population. Um, and almost all the degrees from bachelor's, master's, and PhDs are awarded off of this campus now. And we are now the uh, Indiana's leading or only life science urban research campus. And so the School of Science has uh, grown to, to fit that uh, research capacity to keep up with the med school. And so now engineering, science, all the STEM fields, along with medicine, uh, it is the hot spot for all of Indiana. This is, this is where that stuff is going on. Yeah, and so right behind you, I see you got that background up. You want to explain a little bit about what that is? So I don't know if any of your uh, listeners today uh, can identify this picture up here. Uh, think real hard. Do you recognize anything? I give you a hint. That is 38th Street right there, that big street right there. Recognize anything else? Hmm. In Indianapolis. I was say, is that the fairgrounds? Yeah, so you see the cow barns right there? Okay, so those are cow barns. So if you drive down uh, right in front of the state fairgrounds, the main entrance to um, the uh, uh, fairgrounds is not quite in the picture here. It's a little further down. But uh, those that is the old Purdue University at Indianapolis campus. And when I started here in the early 1980s, my office was in the, right, oh, almost, at it right there. Third floor, that window right there facing, I believe that would be east then. Uh, that was my office right there. And then later on, uh, the library to Purdue is about where my head is, right there. <laughs> and then there are a couple more buildings further down the street here. So it ran the entire length of the Indiana State Fairgrounds along 38th Street, but on the south side of 38th Street. Now it's all been taken over by the, the, the fairgrounds. So that's where I started. I spent the first 10 years there until Purdue moved all the buildings and the engineering programs, uh, the technology programs, and the uh, science programs up to the main campus. And then right after us, uh, about 10 years later, Heron School of Art moved from 16th Street on to the main campus. 
So now all of the uh, pieces of IUPUI now are pretty much on the main campus that we call that, Michigan Street Campus. Today. That's actually really cool. Man, wow. Now we're going to have Innovation Hall added to it, right? <laughs> so but what the interesting thing is, I can't think of any other uh, research unit, well, any university that's grown into a research university and tripled in size just within one person's span of, of a career of 30 years. I was going to say, yeah, that's very impressive. I never realized how, like, that's an insane increase. So, so all of you that have chosen IUPUI, you, you've hit the hot spot, the best kept secret. You think that it's IU Bloomington and Purdue West Lafayette, who used to call us the extension campus down here in Indianapolis. In a few more years, we may be saying IUPUI with its two extension campuses at West Lafayette and Bloomington because knowledge is turning over so fast now that to be in an urban environment where the population is, the government seed is here, everything, this is where you want to learn, train, and to be able to do internships and get right out with, with the public and not what we did 150 years ago for the few people who did get higher education back then would go off to a rural area get their education for five to 10 years if they went to advanced degrees, then come back to urban life and make a contribution to society. Now you do that while you're an undergraduate contributing to the bigger part of society, whether it be a teacher and going out to go do your field work in the school systems. Remember a third of the state's population is with an hour and 15 minute drive of our campus. And it's true. I study government, SPIA, all the sciences, forensic science, this is where the action is. This is where you get your hands-on experience. Yeah. So on that topic of kind of being whatever you want to be, you also mentioned that you didn't start your undergraduate studies as a math major. So can you talk a little bit about your undergraduate, undergraduate years and kind of what led you to math? So, uh, and this is a story worth hearing because it's, it's got a good piece of advice uh, for you. Uh, so when I was in high school, I uh, actually came from Indianapolis. I went to Lawrence Central High School out on the east side. And that was so long ago that they had just built 465 right around where Lawrence <laughs> Central was. There was no Lawrence North yet, okay? And um, we were pretty much surrounded by cornfields at that time. And my graduating class was 250 students. Oh my gosh. Now, Lawrence Central's probably graduating close to 1,000 or more students a year. And they have Lawrence North, too, you know, in, in Lawrence Township. That's true, yeah. That's how things that they've grown. Indianapolis has grown over the last 50 years. But um, I had probably the worst uh, pre-calculus trigonometry teacher uh, ever. Oh. Back then, most people did not take calculus in, in high school. That, you know, a lot of students do that now. But back then, if you got to trigonometry, you were fully prepared to go into science, engineering, that sort of thing yeah. uh, in college. And so uh, I remember trying to stay after classes. You know, I've always done well in math. I'm not afraid of it. Uh, I enjoyed it until I got to trig and the teacher just really turned me off. Uh, uh. She said, uh, I, I didn't quite get these radian things, okay? And so I stayed after classes. I know what degrees are, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, et cetera. But what are these radians? I can't, how do I go from degrees to, and she's, there's no connection between degrees and radians. You just memorize all the radians oh, and, and special angles and all that. And it's like, okay. And, and, and that is such, if you're listening to me now, that is so wrong. Okay. I was um, going to say, I was like, did you find it out? Cause... Terrible education. So I thought, well, maybe uh, I better go into geology because I always did these uh, 4-H projects with soil conservation and all that. And so I figured, hey, I could do geology just fine. And so I went to Michigan Tech, which was an old mining college, and I enrolled in, in geology, and you only had to take one calculus course, oh. and that was at one semester, and you'd be done and no more. And so I said, well, I can do that, so no problem. So I get in there, and uh, I, uh, I think I got a C in mineralogy, and oh. C in physical geology, and I got an A in uh, calculus. And uh, the instructor was an old Polish uh, mathematician used to bang the blackboard all the time, oh. so excited in class and that sort of thing. And uh, he says, 
you know, when I made a mistake or something, he says, well, I did memorize that or something. He says, what are you memorizing math for? It's a language. You just learn to it. And when you get your test, you should be able to recreate all your radian measures. As I thought you just measure memorized radians. No, 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 no. They come from degrees and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So he's, he was the one that turned me on to math is a living thing. It's a language. You need to be able to recreate it during the middle of a test if you forgot. It's not about memorizing things. It's about recreating things. Yeah. So here's the important piece of advice. So when you go to your advisors, be sure you listen to them and go to them every semester. So at the end of that semester, I went into the advisor and says, huh, two C's in, in geology courses and an A in calculus. Most geology majors are the other way around. They struggle through calculus and they barely make it through uh, blah, blah. So uh, he says, so you sure you want to be a geologist? You should be a geological engineer. You got to go through three semesters of calculus. You're going to have to pick up physics and a few other science type courses. Uh, but it would be well worth it because it pays a whole lot better. Oh, no, said, that's nice. <laughs> So I went into geological engineering for the next two semesters and I came back and got an A in the next three courses in math, got an A in the physics courses. And then I think I got a B or C in um, hydrology and a C in uh, microscopy and, and a couple of paleontology or something else okay, for geology majors. And so Man. you sure you wanna be anything to do with geology? <laughs> Geologically, you need to be a geophysicist because it's all math and physics you have already taken all the geology courses a geophysicist would ever need to have. That's where your true calling was. So I did that. I took pretty much, it's a math and physics degree with a little geology in it, is what geophysics is all about. Yeah. Mainly physics was something about the earth. And uh, I, I did that. And when I graduated uh, in the late 80s, uh, excuse me, the late 70s, early 80s, um, we had a terrible recession going on in the US. And in particular, I was at Michigan Tech. And okay. so Michigan got really hit hard because of the car industry was collapsing and all that. So Shell Oil always came to campus uh, and uh, was trying to pick up you know, as many geoscience people as possible. And usually they'll pick up 50 people from there. So we wow. usually have 150 surveyors, 75 geological engineers, um, a couple other master's students in those areas. But, when we got down to geophysics, there's only about three, because it's all about who can do the math. And it's oh, okay, crazy. that's fair. And so normally they pick up 50 people. That year they only picked up the three geophysicists, and that was it. So that opened, doing a lot of math opened up so many doors that that's what employers need to have, is someone who can think, think deductively and do it. Yeah. So once I started with a uh, uh, shell, uh, uh, it wasn't there very long before they realized there's management material. And they said, you need to go back to grad school and then we'll send you over to a foreign office somewhere, get your training, and then you move into management. So you got to become a project engineer uh, and, and that sort of thing. So I said, it's fine. I'll go get, get a master's degree. But instead of doing the MBA, I went back and did statistics. And that led to fluid dynamics. And oh my gosh. The PhD in mathematics. But the secret there was math makes all the difference. And so uh, adding another math course under an engineering degree or onto a science degree, any of the science areas, an extra math course is really what those employers want to see. Because all you know, let, let's say you're a mechanical engineer. Everybody's going to have the exact same courses, whether you went to Ohio State, Purdue, Michigan, Wisconsin, whatever. Yeah. They all have to take the same from the crediting by the same courses. But they see someone took an extra stat course and an extra math course in there. That's signaling something that they are the ones that are going to be able, not just to be able to design what needs to be done, but to be able to solve the math system of equations that are modeling that behavior that needs to be done. Yeah. So you know, see that in biology now, being able to make decisions quickly with all that data out there, data scientists. It's all about being able to get in there and use the mathematics to bring up the numbers you need to see to make decisions. Yeah, like you said, it makes all the difference. So and actually- talk to your advisor every semester because they're gonna be able to see what's going on with those grades and it says, huh, you really want to be a biotech person? Maybe biology or instead of going to medicine, maybe something in biology or some other area is more your forte. Yeah, so that actually brings us to like 
what career paths can you do with a math degree provided like students who are thinking about majoring in math? Everything. <laughs> so now the, the real question should be, what majors are there that having more math would not help you? That's and true. Math is that, that pure language where everyone is going to have to be able to come up with the same answer. So what you're studying in high school right now and what you're going to study in 100 and 200 level college math courses is what other students have been doing and practicing and coming up with the same answers for the last 200 years. And so it's that perfection to be able to get the exact and precise answer, to be able to get that repeatability of that exact answer, and that That's everybody true. else, you can make that deductive argument, this is how it's occurring. Now, I'm not saying other disciplines don't use deductive thinking. So certainly physics and chemistry do quite a bit of deductive thinking, but also your social science courses use deductive thinking, but they don't teach you how to be good at deductive thinking, right? Yeah. So the best course I think most of our listeners today have had that is almost pure deductive thinking is the geometry course in high school. Okay? That's probably not having calculus, we could really care less if you had calculus in high school. If you had, terrific. But that's the first course required for your degree in college. So if you're going to be coming out of a trig course and starting in calc, you're just fine. No problem with that. Okay? Um, but it's that high school geometry course that really tells us if you're a deductive thinker. So okay. most of the knowledge in a geometry course you already knew before you got to geometry. You already knew the three angles of triangle add up to 180. You already knew two parallel lines don't intersect. You already knew, and I could go on and talk about all these facts you already knew from your you know, junior high and first year algebra course, et cetera. Yeah. But it's the um, prove to me the three angles of triangle add up to 180. That's what that geometry course is about. Prove to me two parallel lines will never intersect. Prove to me, right? So you already know the basic fact. You now have like, like a good lawyer needs to be able to do is prove to the jury that this is how it happens and why it happens. That's what math is all about. And that's what employers are really seeking. You've got your engineers, you've got your scientists, you've got your biologists. They're all modeling this behavior. But now you have to deductively prove to me this is what's really going on. And this is the solution that we're working yeah. on. Yeah. Get there. And that's going to make all the difference like you were mentioning. So, so that's what that extra math course you're adding onto your transcript is really doing. It's the language. So it, with a bachelor's degree, the most important thing really an employer, I mean, yes, you've got the degree in this area. That's, that's important to have that set of courses done. But now what else are we looking at if I've got several people applying for the same job? Two big things, mathematics and verbal and oral communication skills. That's really when it push comes to shove and times are hard and I've really got to make some hard decisions. Who can think their way out of a box deductively from their evidence of the math courses? And the other, who can write reports? Who can communicate? Who can stand up and talk to customers or talk to you know, the other managers or the other employees, wh whatever it might be. And without those two skills, you got a degree, terrific, but without the math and the writing and the oral communication, those three things, as a, as a package deal. Now, I like to push math more than anything else because most Americans are bad at math. And <laughs> so most jobs will pay you top dollar for the more math that you have. Think about it. List any, any profession you want from high salary, start now, I'm drawing starting salaries. We're not talking five year out salaries. Okay, so, <laughs> okay. That's the trajectory you're on. So think of those professions that pay quite a bit starting salary. And then think about how much math there must be in there. And those with very low, how little math there must be in there. So That's actually the employers important. figured this out. They are paying for the ability of you to think mathematically, or what we call deductively. And so let, let's take med, doctors, MDs. MDs get paid pretty well. Okay? But not some get paid very well. So the three yeah. top MDs are going to be what? Uh, radiologists. Oh, I'm sorry. You pretty much have to have a physics degree before you even start med school to get to radiology. Oh, That's I didn't really. Anesthesiology. That's extreme. Well, you've got to be able to dose while someone's under anesthesia 
with several different anesthesias running. Oh, what's this guy's body weight? How long has the surgery been going? If the surgeon says, oops, we need to do something else for another 15 minutes, you know, is the anesthesia, I think this person's body weight, their age, how much has already gone in? They got to be able to do those calculations fast and not say, hmm, let me think. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point on that one. <laughs> and then take uh, engineering uh, jobs. Um, engineers get nice middle-class salaries, starting salaries, but the best paid ones are your electrical engineers, your computer engineers, okay, the uh, biomedical engineers, that's true. All of yeah. them have had more math than mechanical engineers. And mechanical engineers get paid better than civil engineers. Civil that's engineering true. only needs one or two calculus courses, and they stop at that. So that's my challenge to you. Think about any sort of profession, kind of rank order them, and then think about how much math must be in there. And there's probably a linear correlation between the number of math courses you needed to be able to get into that profession versus the starting salaries. And yeah. I absolutely yeah. agree. I do want to say one thing. It's not about salaries. It's more important you get a bachelor's degree in what you really love. Yeah, you that's really for sure. the subject area. And if the salary's there by taking a few more math courses, so I'm not saying you have to be, everyone needs to be a math major, but taking on one or two more math courses or getting a math minor is really going to help because it really helps the employer. Oh, you're a biologist. You know, we're on the verge of hiring you. We're pretty sure we want you. Wow, you've got a master, a, bat, excuse me, a minor in math. Even better. Okay, we're, we're going to hire you. Sorry. Yeah, that's true. It makes all so, the difference. Yeah. Right. So actually, it's something you love and uh, enjoy doing because unfortunately, you're not going to be able to retire until you're almost 70, 68 now. 70 yeah. So that's a long time to be out there in the workforce and to do a job you really don't love or feel a passion towards, uh, the, the money is not going to offset that. But yeah. something you love and you can get a little bit higher starting salary because of the math, then you played your cards right. I, I will definitely agree with that. So actually we had some a student last week, she asked a question, she said, um, what kind of experiences outside of the classroom and uh, do you have like any advice for summer researches or summer search or the jobs in her field, she was really interested in math teaching. So the, the, the good thing is you picked IUPUI. And so, as I said earlier, you're right in the middle of an urban center here with lots and lots of opportunities. You are not going to get that in a more residential campus that's in Southern Indiana uh, that does not have a population base for internships and student teaching and, and all the different variety of uh, work study type or uh, co-op type programs. Um, in, in mathematics, we have uh, several different things. One is um, a summer institute uh, for research, uh, which will get you paired up with one of our mathematicians and uh, you will do whatever sort of projects and research they're doing there. So that's a very academic type research type position. Uh, in some fields that's hard to do. Uh, we understand that uh, you are just now getting your feet wet into what research in math might look like. So it may be hard to think about right now, you know, because in high school, remember, you started out uh, with algebras that were close to 3,000 years old. You got up to geometries, which are about 2,000 years old. By the time you got to, if you got calculus done, you're pretty much at the time of Newton. So we're 250 years ago. Okay. This is all old, old, old research. And by the time you finish an undergraduate degree in mathematics, you'll be at what we call abstract algebra. And most of the theorems and proofs done in an abstract algebra course probably come from the time of the American Civil War, 1860s to about 1910, 1920. And then by the time you finish your master's degree in math, you will probably be up to the time of the Vietnam War and logistics theories oh, wow. and that type of stuff. Uh, so, to talk about what a mathematician really researches, you pretty much have to go through the entire ladder and learn all the math before that. Unlike, let's say, biology, where things we are researching today are probably showing up in a high school biology course a few years down the road. It, it, we can talk about it at some sort of level. It's very hard to do, do in mathematics. So, the research opportunities, we try to hold your hand quite a bit and experience you in some projects that uh, maybe aren't cutting edge today, but might be within the last decade, 
for the last two decades. Yeah. yeah. And, so and also actually, keep in mind, half of all the math we know today has just been generated in the last 60 years. That's just insane to think about. So, but 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 you got the math is one of those things. It's the ladder. So you work your way up to calculus now. So you have the time of Newton, <laughs> and then by the time you get done with the bachelor's degree, you're pretty much in the 20th century, uh, mid 20th yeah. century. Maybe. So we actually have somebody who asked a question. So this is kind of back to pertaining to the math minors and everything. So Joshua wants to know: Do you have any advice for going into your first multi-dimensional calculus class? Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, the best thing to do here is uh, realize multidimensional calculus is going to repeat all of the things you learned in the two first single variable calculus courses. So it's not going to be hard conceptually to understand that course. Calculus is about types of functions, limits, the limiting values of those, and taking a derivative and taking an integral. That's it. That's all calculus is about. So when you're in 261, multidimensional calculus, you're going to be repeating that. So no big deal if you've got that down. What is going to be hard, though, what's different now is we're no longer in the plane. We're thinking about three-dimensional space. So how well were you in high school to be able to try and draw three-dimensional figures? The x, y, and z axis, and to be able to get something that looks like some sort of surface in there. Yeah. And now it's about taking derivatives of functions. So now instead of having a function where y is equal to a function of x, we're talking about a function z is equal to a function of x, y, and z, or some parameter t. So now what you're thinking about is maybe a fly flying around this room, okay? <laughs> and here's my origin, x, y, z is equal to zero, and I have a vector now that points to that fly where it is with respect to time. So at three seconds it's here, at 10 seconds it's here, whatever, and now I want yeah. to calculate that entire distance the fly flew. That's what's hard because most people find it very hard because they haven't gotten a lot of training in high school of thinking in three dimensions. So the better you can picture objects, three-dimensional objects in your head, the easier that class is going. And don't get in, let the algebraic computations of the functions get in the way. So yeah. most people find it calculus topics in 261, multivariate calculus, not very hard. That's and good. To get. End is where I just brought it up. There's a course called Vector Calculus. So once you learn that from that course, then you go on and study everything with vectors okay, in, in three dimensional space. Yeah. So do you want to briefly kind of discuss the courses that you have to take for, to get a math minor? Because I know it's very simple for CS majors to get a minor in mathematics. So do you want to kind of elaborate on that? So most. Um, most STEM majors will probably have a minor or very close to it within one course. Uh, some of the life sciences, it would be several more courses. But most of the physical science courses, like if you do a physics degree, you'll probably already have a math minor in there. Yeah. So that's going to be the calculus sequence, two semesters of single variable calculus. Here it's 165 and 166. Which would be taken with you. <laughs> with me, right. And I teach the first one in the fall and the you follow me in the spring. Then uh, the third semester calculus, what we call multivariate calculus, which we were just talking about. That's 261. And then uh, you usually need uh, two more or three more courses. Oh, we have a course called 171, which helps train you think about three dimensional thinking. That's Math 171. That's unique to IUPUI. You will not see that at Purdue West Lafayette or in Bloomington or any other you know, uh, school in the state of Indiana. Uh, so that will be included in the minor. And then uh, we have differential equations, which is required by um, pretty much everybody. All chemistry majors will also take Diff EQ, things like that. And that's our 266 course. And then you need probably one more course on top of that, and that would be math 351, linear algebra, uh, especially if you're going into computer science. A lot of things in uh, the economy and, and in computer science with data mining are driven linearly. So linear analysis helps you think about how to find data in a huge matrix, linear matrix. Sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, if you don't care for linear algebra, you might choose substitute that out with STAT uh, uh, 350, which is our okay. introductory STAT course. It is a calculus-based STAT course, not an algebra-based. 
which most of you, if you had stats, be very similar to stat course you had in high school. It's an AP stat course, except that one is probably algebra-based, not calculus-based. Okay. So is that okay. what the difference between 301 and 350 is for the yeah. stat courses? Stat 301, most people who are non-STEM majors would probably take because it does not rely on calculus at all. It's only algebra-based. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes a lot more sense. That's why I was like, because some people will, I remember when like some people will ask me like, can I just change this 350 for 301 and still get the minor? And I'm like, no, sorry. <laughs> and if you get to a point where you got to choose the last course, your, your advisor will say, just pick any course you want to get the minor. Um, stats is a good one to choose because uh, stats is the study of how to make decisions when you're faced with uncertainty. And so today our society is moving so fast that uh, it is more complicated than ever and decisions are getting more complex than ever to make here. And so how do we make those decisions? Statistics is what trains you to think, well, all right. Uh, well, basically call hypothesis testing. You know, hypothesis, how yeah. do you hypothesis is leading to uh, the solution that, that you need for your company or for you or even your own health care or whatever. You know, you got decisions to make. Do I go on this drug or do I go on that drug? You know, you got to weigh the options, okay? Well, you could flip a coin or you could use statistics. That's true, yeah. <laughs> so actually, I want to take this back just a little bit because you mentioned, you know, all about research and nobody ever really thinks much about math research. So can you kind of explain, like, the favorite, your most favorite place that you've been whether it be for like a conference or speaking about the research you're doing, kind of where were you and what were you presenting on? Okay, so I've been internationally uh, a lot of times. Um, <laughs> before I answer that question, I will throw out one other thing came to mind that I meant to mention when we talk about research. In yeah. math, a lot of our majors in math uh, do um, internships, which would be, uh, we have a lot of actuarial science majors. So they will work with the uh, insurance companies downtown. Uh, again, another reason to come to IUPUI. Uh, actuarial, there's only two big places in Indiana. Insurance tends to run state. It's a state regulated uh, industry. And all of the companies are either in Fort Wayne or Indianapolis. So we are in walking distance and all of our adjuncts work for the companies, AUL, that sort of company. Um, and so it's easy to get internships there. Our math teachers do student teaching. So I would say 75% of our majors in our department uh, do some sort of undergraduate research experience with a professor, a readings course, uh, an internship, a student teaching, that sort of thing. Okay. So having said that, let me get to your question about um, uh, places I've been in. Uh, probably uh, I went to uh, South Africa um, during a part, just as apartheid was ending. So this was oh, in okay. 1990. 293, it's been so long, I can't remember the exact dates. <laughs> it's early 1990s when apartheid fell. Uh, Nelson Mandela had just been freed. Uh, he was running for president down there uh, in South Africa. And uh, the US and most countries in the world uh, had a blockade on South Africa. So no, okay. new, no new technology went down there, um, no new knowledge, no new uh, whatever it might be. So Coca-Cola was not down there. McDonald's was not down there. So apartheid was for a long while there. So all these companies that grew up in the 60s and 70s had been barred from doing any business down there. And so wow. they were basically isolated. So Johannesburg is a huge city, bigger than New York City, right? It has uh, world-class uh, science and uh, medicine going on. So if you remember your history, if you're a biology major, the first successful open heart surgery and heart transplant both occurred in South Africa, you know, way during apartheid, while yeah. we were embargoing that country uh, for all these things. So you kind of think, well, they're, they're up on all the modern technologies and all that. So this would be a very uh, urban setting like New York City or Chicago might be, or Atlanta, you know, big city like that. So you get down there and I was with the uh, largest university down there, University of Witzwateran, and uh, I spent uh, a quarter of a semester there and um, we st I had a laptop that could do beautiful mathematics on it, and be able to spin objects. It was really state of the art. In the 90s, most laptops couldn't even do that. Okay? Oh, man. And you couldn't run it on the battery. You had to plug in the laptop to even get these apps to, to run that way. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, 
So I was going to show that. Well, they had no Macs because when Macs came out, they were completely embargoed. So they had no idea what a Mac was. Okay. And they were still using um, dummy terminals where they had to type everything in and talk to a mainframe. And oh most of the undergraduates were still doing deck cards, which had already disappeared at least 10 years before that. Oh, geez. So here's a leading country in technology and science and all that that is actually being, you know, this is how much embargoes can hurt a country. You know, for very long, they fall so far behind. By the time I, oh, and I had to get my visa by going over to London first because it's an old, it's in the, you know, British Empire. Okay. Yeah. So I had to go to there to the uh, South African embassy to get my visa stamped, then to fly to South Africa. So I did that. Then I got delayed in England uh, for uh, another day because that's when the bombs blew up at the airport. So when I got down oh, there, gosh. a runway strip had gotten bombed. So that's how early we were getting. But the reason they picked me from IEPOI and a couple people from UCLA and, and that sort of thing was that uh, they need to get uh, urban education, higher ed going. And we were the leaders. We were seen as the leaders of doing that in, in major metropolitan areas. So I was down there to do for math education to see how they would get people from the rural areas into urban higher education. Um, so I gave several talks on that. I went to several high schools talking about where the U.S. educational system was and all that. And uh, uh, students kept saying, aren't you surprised and shocked by what our classrooms look like? They're open air classrooms. That's what really. I said. No, no, no. This looks like, you know, Southern California has open air rooms. There's nothing here at all. If I taken pictures of this, brought them home, people would say that looks just like the U.S. What I was surprised about is how many kids in each classroom were disabled and subservient. There are lots of kids that were blind. They do not put silver nitrate in everybody's eyes at birth. Okay? And so a lot of people from birth are blind, or they get blind, or they don't seek medical attention. And so, you know, I oh, said, says, I've been teaching IEPUI at that time by, you know, 10 years or more. And I says, I've never had a, a totally 100% blind student. Here, every classroom I walk into, I see blind students. Right? And that sort of thing. So that was the shocking thing about that country going there, being a major metropolitan area. Um, and then most of their citizens, though, never got the same standard of care, quality education, that sort of thing, that you would think a nation like that, that would only have. And then to show you how fast capitalism works, by the time I left, there was probably a McDonald's on every corner in Johannesburg, and Coke machines, I mean, it was almost like overnight. The dormitories of the university had Coke machines, and they never, they, the stuff they were drinking was so bad, it was like sludge. And they're like, don't you like this Coke? I said, that is not Coke, that's not Pepsi. That's not even RC, sort of soft Oh my gosh. And they, boy, once it came, it was like a, a firestorm. Within six months, you know, it's like all these companies must have been laying out. Yes, this is where we'll put a McDonald's, a Taco Bell, and, you know, as soon as the embargoes went down and, and the trade restrictions went down, and they got yeah. It. So it was well, nice to be there right as all that happened because I saw what the old South Africa was like and I saw them quickly changing to a new one. Now what I need is go back down there now and see, you know. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Later, how much has changed down there. Yeah, so we do actually have to wrap up though okay. since we're getting on the time, but we do really appreciate you coming in and joining us. We, it's always a delight to hear from you. You always have like the best stories ever. So as per usual, um, you know, guys have one thought is that if you have any questions about your math placement, I know where this fall is going to be all topsy turvy and anything may look like it's non routine, but uh, all the situ don't don't get into a mess that you feel you can't get out of. If you think you're in the wrong math class or you need a different math class, just come see me, and we can figure out uh, you know what what section to get into that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely, Doctor Watt wonderful man like he's he's definitely one that you guys want to keep up with uh we'll probably post his email here in the chat to so if you guys have any questions and want to reach out to him looks like Lori's typing it up right now or searching it <laughs> sorry in the little bottom corner but yeah so dr watt like i said wonderful person and there we got the contact info in the chat so if anybody wants to reach out to him or even that even applies when you're in the fall semester feel free to like you said but again, thank you so much, Dr. Watt. We appreciate it. Okay. Good luck in the freshman year. All right. So 
Before we wrap up, we're going to check out the responses to last week's Instagram question of the week. Also, did you notice my uh, mustache fell off halfway through talking to Dr. Watt? That was fun. <laughs> so our episode was focused on professional school preparation. So we asked our current students, what advice do you have for pre-professional students? And the responses were kind of humorous and also serious. So many responses kind of mentioned the importance of GPA and focusing on your first year grades. This kind of sets your path for your future GPA. So make sure you're kind of striving to do your best that you can. And then to kind of put it on a more specific note, somebody said to really pay attention in your organic chem classes because it's gonna help you ace that MCAT. Oh, also, we also had great advice, including finding mentors and study buddies and kind of valuing collaboration over competition. And that's something I definitely agree with on that. But this week's Instagram question of the week is all about math. So we're going to keep up on that one. So we want, to, we want you to kind of get the best out of your experience at IEPUI, which is why we're going to ask the current students, what are your favorite tips and strategy, strategies to ensure math success at IEPUI? College math is definitely kind of daunting. So if you guys ever have any problems with that, trust me, we have plenty of resources available for you. We've got the Mac as well. So if you haven't already, you guys can follow our Instagram at IUPUI Science, where you're gonna be, be able to see our story where the answers are gonna be posted. And if you guys have any questions for the current students to answer regarding math, you guys can send them in as well. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this week's prize for guessing which scientists I am is all up to you. So beforehand, you kind of saw that picture with all of the, the science prize options, the socks, the beanies, water bottles, everything else. <laughs> so make sure you guys submit your guess to science at iupui.edu. For a hint this week, there is a math theorem named after me regarding the sides of a right triangle. So we appreciate everyone that joined today's episode of Science Periodically. So make sure you guys tune in every Tuesday. Next week's guest is Dr. John Guire. Uh, Guire, sorry, <laughs> I always get his wrong. He is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Psychology at IUPUI and also the Assistant Director of Clinical Training. So one of Dr. Guire's Guire, uh, special specialties is kind of positive psychology and he's gonna be here to share information about leading a happier and more meaningful life. And a lot of students actually really like this one. That's probably a fan favorite when we do JAG days. So happiness also kind of might seem a bit hard in a time like this. So making next week episode um, is definitely one you're gonna to wanna to tune into. So before we kind of end, we do have more science students and our science recorder, recruiter, Lori Hart here to answer any leftover questions. And if you guys have any other questions but don't really want to talk, we have an email, science at iupy.edu. So we'll stick around for a few more minutes. So stay logged in if you have any questions for us. If not, you guys are free to go. Have a great day, and we will see you next week. So thanks for tuning in.